Humes High School was one of those drab, three, story relics of the South's 19th century past. A dull, brown brick building, it stood forbiddingly on Manassas Street, Memphis, Tennessee, a monument to all that was strict, southern and no-nonsense. The only good thing about Humes High School on that hot, summer day in 1952 was that the 3.15 p.m. bell had rung, and the kids were pouring out of classrooms like frothy beer from a bottle. 16. Year. Old Red West having been bent into a classroom desk all day, suddenly got a little spring into his lanky gait as he headed for one of the really important things in life, football practice. To Red, school hours spent in the classroom were just pesky interruption to his teenage life of raising hell or playing football or baseball. Red, naturally enough, got his name from a defiant thatch of carrot, colored hair, which he wore in the fashionable crew cut of the era. When time or money was short, the crew cut would often grow out giving Red the appearance of an overused toothbrush. He was a good, natured kid, dreadfully shy at times and easy to embarrass, not very much different from the Red West of today. Quick to go into battle with his fists if someone took too many liberties with his shyness, he had a reputed time of being easy to get along with if left alone, but a sheer terror if rubbed the wrong way. Red was hardly every girl's idea of a school heartthrob. He was freckle, faced and painfully skinny as a legacy of childhood rickets triggered by a dirt, poor southern diet as a baby. But what he lacked in glamour, he made up for in his handling of muscle, footballs and baseballs. Despite his spare build, he was one of the best centers Humes High School had ever produced. Red stopped off at his locker to pick up his football gear. It was not yet 3.30, but the school halls were silent, empty of children. Red clattered eagerly down the polished brown asphalt hallway. His eye was caught by a solitary figure leaning desolately against the wall. Red was struck by the boy's apparent loneliness. He recognized him as a kid in the year ahead of him. Elvis Aaron Presley. Red knew him to say hello to but nothing more. 17. Year. Old Presley was a nice kid, even if he looked a little out of place in the sea of kids with crew cuts and pink scalps. He was pasty, faced with a virulent case of acne. He had long brown hair cut in a ducktail fashion. The handfuls of Vaseline he put on it made it look much darker than it was. Long sideburns intruded into the acne. He had a preference for leather jackets and would often tie a red bandana around his neck in the fashion popular with interstate truck drivers of the era. Despite the fact that Presley was a year senior to Red, in fact in his graduation year, he broke with teenage protocol and addressed Red first. He muttered a shy hi, Red. Red West sighs missed a little these days when he recalls that moment, even just looking at him, I knew something was wrong. Something was bugging him. Red stopped his charge toward football practice and simply said, Hi, Elvis, what's the matter? Something wrong? Young Presley shuffled uncomfortably and said, Up. There's three guys outside who are going to beat me. Red was never slow to lift his dukes to anyone, but he was particularly prone to go into action against bullies. Without looking to see how many were waiting outside, Red nodded his head and said quietly, Let's go check on it and see what it's about. Red led the way along the hallway down some steps and onto the sidewalk of Manassas Street. There stood three boys, high school seniors, like Elvis. It seemed they had some objection about the way Elvis wore his hair. Now, there is no real way of telling when Red West is angry if you go by his voice. It's the same slow Tennessee country drawl that seems to take hours to complete a sentence. Red looked at the biggest boy there. I understand you three fat asses are gonna whip this little guy's 99 ass. The big guy stuttered out an explanation. Hey, man, it ain't your business. We were just gonna talk to him. That's all. Red nodded. Well, that's just fine. I tell you what, you and I will talk here for a while, while he just walks home in peace. Elvis turned quickly on his heels and sprinted home. The confrontation seemed to have ended. The next day, Elvis sidled up to Red after class and said gratefully, Gee, Red, thanks a lot for yesterday. Red smiled, just as shy. Forget it, man. 99 Red has perfect recall for those days. It seems that the way I remember it, someone was always picking on him. Don't know why. He was easygoing enough, quiet, well-mannered, was always respectful of his elders, and he never wised off at anyone. In many ways he was a very good kid, a lot nicer than some of the others around. But if Presley's mouth wasn't arrogant, his appearance was. He would spend hours in the school wash 16. Room combing his ducktail to perfection. When he wasn't wearing a leather jacket and jeans, it was some outrageously colored pair of pegged pants. In the sea of 1,600 pink, scalped kids at school. Elvis stood out like a camel in the Arctic. Intentionally or not, his apt parents expressed a defiance that his demeanor did not match. Red relates, it was that hair, man, it got him into all kinds of trouble. If he had a regular haircut like the rest of us, he probably wouldn't have been both aired. 
but I guess the other kids thought he was trying to show off or something. That hair has always been his crowning glory. I have never known any other human to take more time over his hair. He would spend hours on it, smoothing, mussing it up and combing it and combing it again. Despite the rescue operation by Red, he and Elvis never really got close. It was just a warm hello or a hi there and we'd go our separate ways. We were in different classes so we would see each other a little bit on and off. He would always go straight home after school. He never fooled around in the streets, just straight home. Elvis tried out for the football team but without much success. With a bit more weight and a lot more confidence, he just might have made a good guard. But things didn't seem to work out. I think, says Red. That Elvis lasted on the squad about three weeks. The coach, a good old guy called Coach Boyce, just couldn't stand Elvis and his long hair. Coach Boyce could be a real tough son of a gun and he was always on to Elvis to cut his hair. He just shamed he so much. He finally left the squad. I really felt sorry for him. He seemed very lonely and had no real friends. He just didn't seem to be able to fit in. But I gotta admire him. All that razzing that the kids and some of the teachers gave him about his hair. Elvis would never cut it. That was his trademark. He went his own way without fighting back but 17. He wouldn't give in. He would have rather died than cut that hair. In fact, the way Red remembers it. There was a time when Elvis thought his hair was going to be cut. And he had a look on his face that gave the impression he was going to die. It happened not too long after Red's first rescue operation of Elvis. In those days, when children were forbidden to smoke on the school grounds... The school washroom was the smoking gallery. It was there that all the swingers congregated to sneak their clandestine puffs, away from teachers' watchful eyes. Red walked in to take a leak. The place was full of smoke. You could hardly see in front of you for all the smoke, Red recounts. But I could see far enough to notice that Oldie was in a whole heap of trouble again. About four or five guys had him in there. And they were holding him and pushing him up against the wall and then grabbing him from behind. They were yelling and laughing and wising off at him and his hair. They decided they were going to cut his hair. Now a smart guy usually keeps his nose out of other people's business. I knew the guys who were hassling Elvis. They were on the football squad. I suppose they got this haircutting business from old coach boys. The guys who were giving Elvis a hard time were not really bad guys. Just a bit noisy and stuff. But when I saw Elvis's face... It just triggered something inside of me. I mean we were just kids and they weren't gonna kill him or anything. But there was that look of real fear on his face. He was looking like a frightened little animal and I just couldn't stand seeing it. When you're very poor, you tend to let everyone look after their own troubles. But that face of Elvis's, I can see it to this day. And I saw that face like that many times later. And it always had the same effect on me. Just churned something up inside of me. It's a child's face and it asks for help. Red zipped up and strolled over to the wall where 18... The mob had Elvis pinned. Now, look, said Red to the mob, this ain't gonna do anyone any good. There ain't no need for this. If he likes his hair that way, well, no sense in hassling him. Now, if you cut his hair, you're gonna have to cut my hair too, and that's gonna develop into something else. Once again that lazy, quiet drawl had a dramatic effect. The mob let Elvis go. Before Elvis left, he darted a look at Red that said thanks a million times over. Dave Hebler, who got to know Red as well as anyone, sums up Red this way. You know, if a guy hassles me, I walk away. If he follows me and persists, then, okay, I'll hit him. Now with Sonny, if someone hassles him, he will try to talk the guy out of it. And if that doesn't work, then he'll hit him. But with Red, if someone hassles him, he gives you the two-minute warning. If you don't get the message pretty quick, boom, it's all over. In later days, the three of them together were like the three musketeers. Elvis saw Red the next day and gave him a shy thank you. It couldn't have been easy for Elvis a year older than Red and a year ahead of him at school, to have to thank him twice for getting him out of trouble. In later years, says Red, he remembered those two incidents, although he never mentioned them. Elvis never forgets a damned thing. He has a memory like an elephant. Somehow, you know, that year 1952 put me in a role as Elvis's protector. It wasn't a role I looked for. It just happened that way. It was a role that Red assumed for the next 24 years in one way or another. Elvis had a way with me. Sometimes he was like a damned spoiled kid who needed to be spanked. And other times he was just so helpless and needing of help it was like he was your own child. It's a job I took on readily and had a lot of fun doing and a lot of heartbreak. And even now, I still feel it's my job. Even if I never see him again. 19. Delbert Sonny West ran his hands through his bristly U.S. Air Force regulation haircut and looked at the spectacle before him with amazement. Only half an hour earlier, he had walked through the main gates of the rodeo grounds in Tucson, Arizona. With I him was a quiet, corn-fed southwestern girl whose demeanor and looks suggested that when someone invented virginity and apple pie, they must have had her in mind. The dainty face on the Sunday, 
best dress she was wearing told him immediately to resist cursing in her presence and scrap any thoughts of ever squaring. Yet only a half hour later, she was behaving totally out of character, like a sex starved little nymphette. Perhaps he was wrong after all, and the night would not go unrewarded. The reason for her transformation was up there on the stage. Elvis Aaron Presley, the kid from Hume's high school, where Sonny West had also gone, four years behind Elvis. Elvis Presley, his hair shining like sprayed patent leather, was straddling the microphone in the most suggestive of manners. His groin gyrated inches from the upright stand, and he was shaking in convulsive movements as if possessed by an alien spirit. When he sang quietly he sobbed. When he sang loudly, he commanded his worshippers. The women seemed to be beset by alternating emotions, from motherly pity to slave-like obedience. His lips, curling down on the right side of his mouth, arrogantly pouted suggestion and triumph. Then his mouth would twist in pain, and a thousand females screamed in pity and wanted to enclose the poor child in their arms. Since my baby left me, the words of Heartbreak Hotel, already a stupendous seller, had the women crying out in pain for his loss. My God, thought Sonny West, and this is pimply-faced Elvis Presley, who only four years ago had to look to my cousin Red to get him out of jams. It was hard for me to believe, he recalls. 20. Sonny was having considerable trouble keeping Miss Apple Pie in her seat. Sonny was in the Air Force and had gone along to the rodeo ground, which was not far from his base to see what all the fuss was about this kid he'd gone to school with. Believe me, this gal changed right before my eyes. I had heard all the publicity and I knew Red was very close to Elvis, but it didn't really seem to make any impression on me. He was just a country and western singer who had got onto the rock and roll bit. But this gal, I'm telling you, if someone had grabbed that lady there and then and dragged her off to bed, it would have happened there and then. Every time he moved, it seemed like a couple of hundred gals were getting it off. Then, after the show, my gal just went back to what she was like before. It was as if all that carrying on was for Elvis and nobody else. Sonny never did score with the lady, but the incident gave him a preview of the awesome control Elvis had over a female audience, a power that Sonny was to see underlined a thousand times in the years to come. Sonny never knew Elvis at school. Just saw him in the hallway now and then, he recalls. I was about four years behind him, so there was no call to know him. Maybe if he had been a big football hero or he had been a bit of a wild man with his fists. I would have made it my business to know more about him, but really he was just an older kid who happened to get noticed because he had this long hair and pretty wild clothes. He was pretty much of a nobody. But now Elvis Presley was indeed a somebody who, Sonny now realized, had had something hidden far inside him when he was at Hume's high school. Now it was all coming out. Sonny wanted to go backstage that night and try to see Elvis, but he was too shy, and anyway he probably wouldn't have been able to get near him. The year was 1956 and Heartbreak Hotel was setting sales records all over the country. Churchman 21 were preaching about the evil of Elvis Presley. Even the communist press of Eastern Europe saw Elvis Presley as the main reason why American youth was so degenerate. In fact, they said, Elvis Presley was just about the best reason communist youths should stay communists. In popular appeal, Elvis Presley was surpassing even Valentino. There was Frank Sinatra, too, of course. But Elvis was someone American youth could call its very own. Two more years of worldwide hysteria over Elvis would pass before Sonny West met him. I knew my cousin Red was very close to Elvis, Sonny recalls. They had become like brothers, but when they were teaming up, I was off somewhere else. Then I joined the Air Force, so I was not in on it at the beginning like Red was. By the time I met him, it was 1958. Elvis was getting pretty close to going into the Army, and Red had done a stint in the Marines. When Red came back to Memphis on leave, he would always be with Elvis on his gigs. In fact, just about anywhere he went, Red was with him. I had just got out of the Air Force, and I told Red I wanted to meet him. I was a pretty typical Southern kid at the time. A crew, cut Hellraiser who was easy to impress. If Sonny was expecting to see a sophisticated, elegantly tailored superstar clinking champagne glasses with other celebrities, he was in for a big disappointment. Red told me he would introduce me. Sonny recalls. So he told me to come on down to the Rainbow Roller Skating Rink. Roller skating was big in those days in Memphis. If you didn't go to the movies on a date, then you took your date to the Rainbow. Elvis was 23 at the time and the biggest single, recording star in the country. Today, 23, year, old superstars would go to a roller skating rink with the same enthusiasm they would go to church. But Elvis was a different sort of superstar. Despite his outrageous gyrations on stage, he was very faithful to his deep south roots. 22. He lived with his parents, whom he adored. He was polite to the point of humility with his elders, and his pleasures were decidedly simple. In those days, says Sonny, 
Elvis would rent the roller rink for himself and his boys from midnight onwards. There would often still be fans hanging around, and occasionally they would join in. He was always polite and considerate to them. For most 23-year-olds, roller skating would probably have seemed a bit juvenile, but it was as if Elvis was trying to make up for the things he had missed out on as a kid at school. Elvis would keep on visiting that rink right into the early 1960s. Other nights, he would rent the Memphis fairgrounds from the owner a local character named Wimpy Adams. He would ride the roller coaster and the dungeon cars with his Memphis friends until dawn some mornings. It was just plain, clean fun, but they were among the best days of our lives. Red's life, my life and I know Elvis's life. Sonny met Elvis on a spring night in 1958. He went to the rink with his brother, in, law, Bill Thorpe, a superb athlete who was Memphis All, school's boxing champion. It was just before midnight, and we just hung around the edge of the rink until Red rolled up with Elvis. He introduced us and Elvis couldn't have been nicer. He shook hands and asked about my time in the Air Force. We shot the breeze for a while. He seemed genuinely interested in me and what I had to say. He was, despite who he was, a very ordinary kind of guy. He was as good, looking as hell, but he seemed to take all the girls falling all over him as a bit of a joke. It hadn't gone to his head. You just couldn't meet a nicer guy. In the years to come, whenever Red remembered that first impression of Sonny's, he would get a lump in his throat, because Elvis did indeed change, even if it wasn't his fault, he changed. Elvis turned to get onto the rink, extended a warm 23. Handshake, gave that curled, lip smile of his and started to laugh as he eyed Sonny and Bill Thorpe. He left them with the comment new meat, huh? Red smiled back at Elvis, rubbed his hands together and said, yup, Elvis, new meat. And neither Sonny nor Bill understood what they meant, although they soon would. Elvis, Red and a crowd of insiders, including Elvis's cousins, Bobby and Junior Smith, started to skate around the rink. Sonny recognized the Smith boys. They had another brother, Billy, who would become part of Presley's entourage when Sonny hit the road. Bobby and Junior were not as fortunate. They were the black sheep of the Presley family and were later exiled to the outer limits of the group. But in those days they were about as skillful skaters as one could find in Memphis. A little after midnight, Sonny and Bill Thorpe noticed that several cardboard boxes had been brought on the scene. Inside was an assortment of pads for the shins, shoulders, elbows and knees. Looked a pretty sensible idea, recalls we weren't very good skaters, so we started to put Sonny. Them on. If we fell over we wouldn't get hurt, and seeing most of us played football, it was a good idea to keep the injuries down. Then Sonny and Bill saw what the pads were really for, and they realized what Elvis's new meat remark meant. The group on the floor had divided themselves up into two teams and were playing a game called War. The game had extremely simple rules. Both teams charged each other, and the object was to knock the opposition off their feet. Sonny remembers Bill Thorpe looking at this. We said, are you crazy? I'm not getting in there with that stuff. Sonny was not as prudent, particularly as his cousin, Red, dared him to get on the floor. Sonny relates, I must have been mad, but it was too late. The next thing I knew I was on the floor. 24. Junior Smith was the referee. He blew the whistle and the war was on. Sonny was on the team opposite Red and Elvis. There were no rules except a gentleman's agreement that there would be no punching. Despite the fact that the toughest guy on the opposition team was Red West, Sonny had no real trouble from him. D but, lordy, there was this gal, I'll never forget her she flat, asked killed me, says Sonny. I would be skating along, then wham, this gal would knock me flat. Elvis would see this and burst out laughing. I would get up and, wham, down I would go again. When I first got in there and saw a woman on the other side, I was ready to go easy on her. But I grew to where I wanted to kill her. After about half an hour she had near broken me in half. One time she sent me skidding into the railing and I split my cheek. Elvis always had a first, aid man there. So he patched me up and I went on the floor again. In the end, I saw her coming toward me, and I set myself to send her flying. Well, man, that was a mistake. When she hit me, she knocked me flatter than attack. Me, six, foot two inch me, and a gal knocks me flat on my ass. This time... She hit me so hard that I hit my head on the floor and that was it. I was out cold. When I regained consciousness, there was Elvis standing over me, laughing that boyish laugh. He looked down and said, new meat, huh? Those Sansof bitches knew all along what she could do, but it was great fun and Elvis was fun to be with. Sonny and Red recall that Elvis played hard and tough on those nights, and he reveled in the rough and tumble. At last, Elvis Aaron Presley was one of the boys. Well, not quite. Corrects Red. We made sure that he never really got hurt. We were always looking after him. Nobody picked on Elvis. Most of us were 25. Very close friends. Occasionally, 
an outsider would come in and try to show off in front of his girlfriends, trying to take Elvis out. About a week after Sonny came to the rink there was one guy who was making a real ass of himself, just going for Elvis and nobody else. Well, we took care of him real good. After the first night, Sonny and I were always on Elvis's team. Well, this one guy, Sonny and I taught him a lesson. We high, load him and sent him about 15 feet through the air. Lucky he didn't hit the railing or we would have killed him. Elvis liked that kind of loyalty. Elvis was only a few weeks away from going into the army. He took an immediate shine to the big, husky, handsome Sonny. Red knew that Sonny was going to be on the Elvis team for a long time to come. Elvis had told Sonny that when he returned from his stint in the army, he would like to see more of him. There was only one little note of discord. Elvis told Red a week before leaving for Germany, he's a heck of a nice guy, your cousin Sonny, but he never stops saying son of a bitch. He calls everyone son of a bitch. I just wished he would stop saying it all the time.